Okay, well, here we are, episode <laughs> two, with uh, Conversations with DJ. Uh, today, my guest is uh, James Blake. Do you have a middle name? Riley. Riley. So yeah. James Riley Blake. How did that come about? Riley is a family name. So my grandfather's name was James Riley Blake, and then so it ended up also becoming my daughter's name. My first daughter, we were, we were struggling with, with girls' names, um, and we had our boy name all picked out. We found out we're having a girl, and we were really struggling, and we ended up going with, uh, with family names. So she's Riley, and her middle name's Elizabeth because my wife's middle name is Elizabeth. So my middle name and my wife's middle name. Okay, that's awesome. Very <laughs> cool. What was the uh, what was the boy's name that you wanted? Would have been Will. We would have had a Will if we had a, if we ever had a son. We had I have two daughters. If we had a son, I would have had a William Blake. But no, no, <laughs> that's no Will. Amazing. No Will. We're we're done. We had two girls, and we're uh, we're happy and, and done with that. Okay. Um. Very cool. Yeah. So James, uh, obviously, um, I was born in two thousand. You were playing up until two thousand thirteen, yep. I think. So yep. I started playing in tennis when I was four. Okay. And, you know, basically growing up, I was like probably 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? I was actually watching you play tennis, <laughs> right? And yeah. I'm not going to lie, um, the times that you played Roger, I'm, okay. <laughs> I might have been cheering <laughs> for Roger. I was shooting. The rest of the world was too. I don't blame you. He's the nicest guy. So I don't, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. But I do remember, and we talked about this before, mm -hmm. you were playing a match at the US Open mm -hmm. and you had a match point, you were returning. <laughs> and somebody, I don't yeah. know who it was, but they served yeah. the first serve to your <laughs> forehand. Yeah. You like set. You know, set up here, <laughs> hit a forehand return, I think yeah. down the middle, yeah. and it went by so fast, <laughs> he wasn't able to, like... It didn't even move. Not not a move, not a racket yeah. on it. Um, yeah. And then I think you ended up maybe yelling for about, like, four, <laughs> four to five seconds. Um, yeah. So h how did that shot feel? Oh, my goodness. That one felt good. That was one of those... So was, I do remember it really well. It was against Jesse Hutika Lung, and the, um, he was a qualifier. It was in the, the second round of the U.S. Open, and he just served... It was love 40 and four or five in the fourth. And I was just, you know what? If he serves this to my forehand, it's going back harder than it's coming in. I, I just know if, if he serves my forehand, because I was just like, I don't think he's going to. Maybe he's going to try to sneak one by me on a down triple match point. And he did. He went right exactly where I was looking. It was like a, a you know, a, a hitter waiting on, you know, just dead red right in the zone. And I just waited on it and I absolutely killed it. And um, just to finish a match like that at the U.S. Open, I mean, the feeling it's why I get why a lot of athletes struggle when they retire and you miss out on that feeling of just the electricity of the crowd going nuts. And, you know, however many people were there that day, 15,000 or so going crazy as you swing and, and do one thing. So it was something you've done your whole life and loved doing and enjoyed doing and seeing them make a memory out of it and enjoy it. And the fact that you're, you know, you can bring that up however many 15, 20, nearly 20 years later, you know, that's pretty special to me. And it makes me think that I, you know, a lot of the hard work that I did was really worth it. Yeah. And honestly, it was unbelievable to watch. Uh, one thing that I want to touch on real quick was I know, or I think your highest ranking was number four yep. in the ATP, right? Yep. Um, which is unbelievable. Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, not a lot of people get to do that. Yeah. Um, was that, in your personal opinion, uh, your biggest accomplishment or was there a win out there, maybe a championship yeah. win? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So I th actually think it's, it's, it's a little strange because I got into an individual sport. You obviously play an individual sport with pickleball as well. And so you would think everything is about the individual, but probably my proudest moment or one of my best memories and fondest memories of the tour was the winning a Davis cup in 2007. And that's a team event. Um, just because I always say like, I, I, played tennis and I loved it and I there's tons of pressure on you every time you step on the court but I never felt really nervous except for Davis Cup in the Olympics and that was when you have USA on your chest and you feel like you're representing something more than than just yourself and just your family and just um, you and all the hard work you've done you're chosen as one of the representatives of your country and that uh, to me the first time I ever played Davis Cup was the first time I got on court and had legitimate butterflies in my stomach um, where I was really really nervous and um, so for us to go through that from when I first played in 2001 to 2007 and doing it so often with the Bryan brothers and Andy Roddick and Andy being, you know, really our, our leader, um, was just a ton of fun. And those guys are, will be friends for life because of what we went through and then to win it on home soil against Russia, um, all of us playing a part, Andy winning first, then me winning, then the Bryans winning that weekend in general was, uh, was probably my favorite memory of, um, um, of my career. Uh, and yeah, the, the individual accolade of getting to number four in the world was, 
you know, I'm extremely proud of it. I'm proud of it, you know, anything I did because I know the work it took to get there. But my favorite, I think my favorite moment was winning the Davis Cup. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, when it comes to Davis Cup and you're talking about having the Bryan brothers mm -hmm. and your team and Andy Roddick, I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about they were all three of them were number one in the world at one point. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Like just looking back at it in 2007, and I was only really seven years old. But that <laughs> said, you know, looking back at it now that I'm 24, that sounds like a pretty like stacked team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, were, we were we were really stacked, but that we had gone through some such tough times. Um, I mean, not, not real tough times, but mm -hmm. tough times in tennis. I don't want to get it confused with people saying, "Look, you guys are athletes. You're you're just playing a game," but you know, tough losses where we, and myself and Andy, when we lost to, to France in the semifinals at, at Roland Garros, it was a brutal, brutal match. And then the year before in 2006, when we really thought we were going to win it that year, um, I was, that was the year I was number four in the world. Andy was five ish or six in the world. The Bryans were number one in the world. So we really thought, okay, this is our chance to win it. And we go in and we lose to Russia in Moscow um, on clay. They had a pretty slow clay court. Andy loses a heartbreaker in the fourth match to, um, uh, Dmitry Tursunov, I believe it was like 17-15 in the fifth set, and we really thought it was going to come down to the fifth match, me against Murat Safin, which would have been a battle. I actually played him the next week and beat him 7-6 in the third, so like that would have gone on in, in Davis Cup with that kind of pressure. And um, So we, we, we had these, all these times where we thought we were going to win it, and then going into 2007, um, things aligned a lot better, and we, we did get that, that victory. And it was just – it hadn't happened in the States uh, since the 90s, so we were um, – you know, we had a lot of pressure on us. The uh, United States had for a long time dominated the Davis Cup, and it hadn't happened in a long time. So we really felt like we wanted to we wanted to win the Davis Cup. So that was a it was a real special feeling, even though, yeah, on, on paper, it looked like we were really, really stacked. It's just, you know, it's such a short um, sample size because it's just, you know, you have four weekends throughout the year. And so you have a bad weekend and it's only two singles players and, and one doubles team. You know, one of those singles players is off. It's tough to win that match. So um it, it was it was tough going for a few years there and then to win it it was just it was really special and also the fact that we all genuinely got along and liked each other and had some fun and you know great like the weeks leading up to it were some of the most fun i had on tour because you're just playing cards in the locker room playing pranks on some of the guys hazing some of the the rookies the practice partners and just having a great time um those are some of my memories that i'll always have and we'll always share when i you know talk to andy and the brian brothers as well we, we've got a lot of fun fun memories yeah, and, and the fact that you can relive those moments mm -hmm. even now in 2024, mm -hmm. like I can already tell how much those meant to you, oh, right? Because yeah. yeah. there are so many times in our lives that we go through something, whether it's good or bad, but it's yeah. always kind of blurry when all the years go through. Yeah. And so for you to be able to like pinpoint like a certain score in a match yeah. or a certain time during the year, like back in that year, yeah, I mean, just really goes a long way, and we're all able to tell how much you cared about it, right? Yeah, and it's it really is special because that's that's funny funny enough. Like that's a lot of times how I remember things. Like, oh, when did that happen? Oh, well, I was playing in this tournament, and I had that match going on. So that oh, so that was 06. Okay, so that happened in 07. And, <laughs> but that 07, that weekend in Portland, I'll, I'll definitely never forget. And I, I was lucky enough. Like I have a lot of good friends that actually kind of um, supported me throughout the whole time. I had a lot of ups and downs in my career and they were there for the down times, mm -hmm. um, but they were also there for that weekend. And I still remember it was, you know, a ton of my friends, my brother, uh, Thomas was there. My brother, Chris was there. And, you know, for them to, to be there supporting, my mom was there. Uh, and then probably 20 or 30 of my friends were just, they had flown in. They, they wanted to see that. They knew how much it meant to me. And it meant so much more having them all there and then going out and celebrating on uh, on Saturday night after we clinched it, too. And just, uh, you know, I'll never forget even that night. I mean, it's not something that, you know, goes in the scorecard or, or anything or down in history and anything that I did. It wasn't even like that, you know, special of a night. We didn't have a huge parade or anything like some of the other teams did. But just having that night out and sharing it with, with true friends, it means it really means a lot to me that I had those people because it's, I mean, it's the same people that were the, the J block. I don't know if you remember that at the U.S. Open. They were the crazed fans that had the the J block shirts on and they were going nuts for me because I grew up an hour from there and everyone's like oh my goodness these are you know just some idiot drunk fans or whatever and they didn't realize that those are the people that I still stay in touch with that uh, you know were there when I was down that I care about everyone I knew every single one of those people with the crazy light blue shirts on I knew their life stories uh, they knew mine they knew everything about me so um, it was a lot more special for me to win in front of them too yeah that's awesome so you mentioned, um, obviously, Davis Cup is a huge accomplishment, right? Yeah. Um, we all know if we played some tennis, right? Obviously, I was never nearly as good as you guys. 
Um, I try, but you know, I heard you're pretty never... good. Steve Dawson says you had, you had plenty of talent. He said he you uh, he used to work with you when you were a tennis player. Yeah, it was interesting because like they the way that I always see uh, saw it is mm-hmm. if you're a good junior, mm-hmm. you're still not good at tennis, right? Because like <laughs> yeah. there's so many levels, yeah. right? I mean, even Absolutely. even when you were number four in the world, which is yeah. unbelievable, like was it Roger number Roger one at the time? One. I mean, that's yeah. probably another like layer, right? Yeah. So it's like, there's just so many layers when you get into sports that, yeah. you know, when I tell people that I was like, okay, at tennis, like, mm-hmm. I'm a good junior. It doesn't yeah. really mean much, right? Yeah. Like to me personally. Yeah. It can show some level of talent and mm-hmm. then, but yeah, there is, there is definitely a, a, a big jump. And I, I think you're right. People don't realize uh, in any sport. Uh, that's why I always, kind of say to people is like if you if you're talking to someone about what they really do for a living you should let them talk about it you yeah. know because you know you, what you do as a pickleball player like I've gotten you know to be okay at pickleball but I know that there's a big jump between me being pretty good at pickleball to the people that take it seriously and play it all day and, and really train for it the same as if someone gets in the in the pool and starts swimming and then they say, oh, well, I, I could probably be, you know, similar to Michael Phelps. No, you can't. Like, you don't <laughs> no. get the difference. And, like, you can you can say you're you're a good junior, even, like, an okay college player or something. But, like, the difference, similar with golf. Like, they always say, uh, the saying I hear about golf is, if you're a scratch golfer, which everyone at, the, everyone at your country club will think you're a great golfer if you're a scratch golfer. But the difference between a scratch golfer and a pro is greater than a scratch golfer in an 18, which is basically like a beginner because there's just so much further to go to get from being a good golfer to being that pro. Same with tennis, same with pickleball, same with really any sport that has a, a professional uh, ranks to it is that to get to be that pro, you have to do so much more and there's so much more nuance to almost every sport there is um, that there's there's a lot of hard work and there's you know some of the amateurs don't really understand what that takes to get there. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 all, and all, a lot of them, I just don't think they had the chance to play somebody, uh, let's say, like me in pickleball, mm-hmm. right? Like maybe yeah. they live in a small town in, mm-hmm. in Kansas or whatever, and they don't have anybody that's at that level to kind of like look up to. Yeah. Right. So yeah. maybe they're just not aware. Um, but yeah, I know there's a lot of, uh, especially like tennis people, because that's mm-hmm. where I come from, uh, to some extent, even though I think I'm more of a pickleballer now, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. that's like, well, you know, when, when I was little, I was this good and blah, blah, yeah. well, it probably doesn't mean much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a lot of people out there that can say they have wins over me when they were mm-hmm. 14 years, when I was 14 years old or 12 years old. And I don't, I, you know, I don't remember some of them. I remember some of them, but, um, didn't quite pan out to be the same, kind of athlete because there's just differences in you know in how you develop and then how you uh how you use your talent because i i really believe i got to four in the world i believe there were um a decent number of people that never cracked the top 100 that had just as much talent as me it's about all the other little things that go into uh kind of crafting a career to get you to that top 10 in the world as opposed to um you know falling prey to a lot of the hurdles that are there along the way yeah totally and Talk to me a little bit about, you know, you were number four in the world, mm-hmm. uh, huge accomplishment, and you're saying it takes a lot to get there, right? So what, yeah. does, what does a day, what does a week of, of training look like for you? It must have been so, brutal. Yeah, yeah. When I was sort of in the middle of my career, and I, I, you do a little bit of trial and error. I was always someone that felt like you, you, have to, you have to see, you have to push it a little too far on each side no matter what. And when I first started uh, getting on tour, I definitely pushed it to like I was actually overtraining. I did too much and I was doing two a days every day in the heat in Tampa, Florida. And so two a days every day, then in the gym, then on the track and then, you know, run it right back again the next day. So I started learning um, kind of what my body could take. My body started breaking down then after a few weeks of trying to do that. So and even at, you know, 20 years old, your body shouldn't be breaking down at that point. So, um, OK, this is too much. This is what my body can handle this is what it can't handle. So what I would try to do a lot of times when I had my training weeks was uh, to try to simulate our most important events of the of the year are our Grand Slams. And those are you play one day on one day off one day on one day off and the day on can be a really long one three out of five sets. So a lot of times my training would be a really long day, which would be four to five hours or so on the court. Um, and then almost every day, uh, I think I told you this was some, well, when we play big ball, like pretty much every single day, um, with maybe take, except taking Sundays off was footwork drills. Yeah. So there's always, whether it's only 20 minutes or whether it's an hour of some sort of sprints or footwork or agility drills on the court. So even on a four or five hour on court day, still going to do some footwork and agility drills at the end. Um, and then in the gym, maybe only about three, three, four times a week, maybe 
Um, cause you can only do so much. Like I, when you're training and running and doing all that for me, at least my body, I couldn't do a ton of lifting. Um, so I did enough to, to kind of maintain, but only in the off season would I ever do any sort of heavy weight to try to uh, kind of gain a little bit. Otherwise it was all a lot of maintenance lifting, but then the, the second day, so you do a, a real hard day, four or five hours, then in the gym, then, uh, agility, all that, it ends up being six or seven hours. You're at the courts and then, um, the next day you take it a little easier. So then it's probably an hour and a half, um, ish. And then you do a little bit more fitness or I would do a little, this is what I would do. So I'm not saying there's any one formula, which is the great thing I love about tennis and pickleball as well is there's no formula that works for every person. This is what worked for me is I would do a real long day and then do a shorter day and get that feel of like, okay, this is what a grand slam is going to feel like. It's going to have a tough day because you can't, you can never simulate the pressure and the, uh, the nerves that are going to go in to a three out of five set match in a grand slam, but you just do your best to, to kind of break your body down and then you've got an easier day or it's an hour and a half. Um, and then you do a little workout as well. So you're only at the courts for maybe three hours total between your, your stretching, your warm up, your cool down, your, your agility and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and then get right back to another long day. So that would be of the six days. You do three really hard days, three easier days, and then I would take one day a week off. And that was what I, I mean, for many, many years, that was, that was my life. And I, I actually truly enjoyed it. And that's one thing that, that changed towards the end of my career. And what made me realize it was time to, to maybe be done was I loved that in the middle of my career, like feeling like I was getting better on those days. And even the days when I'm having a short day, I know I'm getting better because I'm letting my body rest and I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do by the end of my career, if I did one long day, the next day I could barely get on the court and play. And my, my body was just broken down and I had to be on the table. Then it was more, my PT was with me all the time and I was just on the table for, if I had a four hour practice, I was then on the table the next day for four hours, just getting worked on. So it was just, it was, and I was just getting back to neutral. So it was really a, that was what was difficult for me was that I didn't feel like I was getting better. That's one thing that I love in life in general is the feeling of getting better. That's why I love pickleball right now yeah. is that I'm still getting better. I mean, I, I think I played with you probably a year ago or two or a year and a half ago or whatever. And then I played with you more recently and I hope you think that like I've gotten yeah. better. And so like, that's why it's fun for me. And I, I still, the reason I, I love tennis is because I'm not doing it at the same level I was doing it at, but I can help people get better. I can, uh, you know, the only times I really play tennis are hitting with younger players that I can hopefully um, give some of the advice that I learned from the mistakes I made, the things I did right. Um, but for pickleball I, on my own, I can actually get better, which is a ton of fun. Cause, um, you know, I didn't, I don't, um, I don't have that many things that I can really like look to a competitive, uh, you know, environment in anymore, but this is one that I can get better and feel like I'm improving and, uh, I'm playing with new players and getting to play with people like you and Callen and Hayden and stuff. It's uh it's, it's really a treat for me to, to see like that, that really high level and, have something to, to play for. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And going back to what you were saying, so you were talking about you know you don't spend as much time at the gym as you do, yeah. you know, time on court, right? Mm -hmm. I think you know what I was saying earlier or yesterday in this case is that the number one thing for you to be good at your sport mm -hmm. is to actually be good at your sport, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's like what comes first. Right? Yeah. So you want to get really good at tennis. Mm -hmm. And then what I was mentioning is once you're really good at tennis, everything else kind of like the cherry on top, right? Yeah. So it's like you can do your nutrition, you can do your sleep, mm -hmm. you can do your workouts and all this stuff, but you really just have to be really good at tennis to begin with, right? Yeah. And so right now, what I'm hearing is so like what I'm doing in pickleball is the complete mm -hmm. opposite that you were doing in tennis. So this is actually helping me kind of like, you know, change up what I'm going to do starting from today on. Because mm -hmm. for some reason I felt, and everyone's different, right? But yeah. for some reason I always felt like the bigger that I got, the better that I would look, the more confident I would look and play at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I got to the point where I'm doing straight like two, three hours of pickleball a day. Mm -hmm. And I work out for about an hour and a half and it's like straight like weightlifting. Yeah. Not a lot of footwork, not a lot of cardio. But yeah. it sounds like, because I would, if, I don't know if you agree, but... Tennis and pickleball are decently similar. Yeah. They still have, you know, their differences and stuff, but I think it's somewhat similar, at least to the, um, when it comes to, you know, what you should be good at, physically mm -hmm. speaking, you know, speed, reaction time, yeah. ride, agility, maybe yeah. flexibility, mobility, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so 
uh, you know, for all the viewers out there too, just to know that you're better off if you're playing pickleball, you're better off working on your speed, speed and mobility, mm -hmm. uh, footwork drills, yeah, and you know maybe take lifting a little lighter, which is exactly what I'm gonna do. After this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's just the way. I, like I said, it's it's different for everybody, but that's what I thought was that the footwork is is so important, and I see it now in today's game. Um, if you look at the top hundred men in uh, in the ATP. There's, I don't think you could find one that's not a good mover. You know, the the people you have to be a good mover now on tour. Um, the people that you even think of as not good movers take someone that you know. It's always been a knock on him is Taylor Fritz. He doesn't have unbelievable. But if you actually watch him for a guy that's about six five, he does move pretty darn well, and that's considered not good for on tour because yeah. everyone. It's really just because the comparison. Everyone else moves so well. Um, so for me, that is really important. Getting yourself into the right position. I think in pickleball, the same thing. Like. Um, a big part of it is getting yourself in the right position to hit the shots you want to hit. So I think that's more important than having the um, the just you know that brute strength because I think you see um, in a lot of in a lot of sports that have skill involved, which is why tennis and pickleball are, in my opinion, I love them. You know both, but um, they're they're pretty impressive to be good at because you have to be good at so many different things. Yeah. I think it, other sports, some other sports, and I'm not trying to diminish any of them, but they take maybe like one or two skills and they don't really encompass everything in pickleball and tennis. You have to be, you have to be a good mover. So your footwork has to be good. You have to have great hand eye coordination to be able to, you know, hit the ball in the center of the paddle or the racket. Then you have to have um, good reflexes, uh, especially in pickleball. You got to have reflexes to be able to handle the, you know, kind of those firefights. Um, so it, it combines them all and you have to have endurance in tennis, especially, you know, three out of five sets in the heat, you gotta have endurance. So you got to do so many different ways of training. And so for, I think for the individuals, what's fun about tennis and what's fun about, you know, anything like that is you have to find what works for you. So are you someone that naturally already has endurance? So you don't need to train as much for that. So, okay, now you can put a little more time into your skill. But I also think most people have a little bit of a, I don't know about a clock or like a way that. You can only do so much before you get a little burnt out. So where are you going to spend that time? It's sands in an hourglass. Like once that hits empty, like there's not much else you can do because your, your mentality is kind of cooked. And that's the other thing that goes into tennis and pickleball is the mind, you know, the, the scouting reports, the how you're going to handle the, the ups and downs of uh, a, an individual game or of an individual season. So um, there's so much that goes into it and you need to figure out what works best for you. And if, if for you, it's OK, we need to shift a little more into footwork. I do think that's more important than the brute strength in, in pickleball and in tennis. And, um, and then it's how much of the skill, because are you, how, and I think a lot of that comes down to sort of doing scouting reports that we all do scouting reports for our opponents, but trying to figure out a scouting report for yourself. Yeah. And when you do that, like, how am I losing more of the points? Am I losing them because my feet aren't in position or am I losing them because my hands aren't quick enough? Or am I losing them because I didn't, recognize a pattern early enough or, or, you know, what am I doing? Or, or was it a mental mistake? Is that something I can train? Uh, is that, um, a psychologist that I need to go to, to talk about, okay, you know, being more in the moment and figure like whatever those things are, it's, it's, that's what I love. Like I said, I love sports so much. I love tennis because you can always figure out ways to get better. Pickleball, I think is the same. And that's why it's fun for me now too. Yeah. And it's so hard to pinpoint, right? Because whether it's ego or whether mm -hmm. it's like, you know, try, like it's a little hard to look at yourself in the mirror sometimes. Yeah. Right? It's like, no, I'm, I'm perfect. Right. Yeah. Or, or, you know, I'm, I'm good enough or it's, it's my partner that's messing up. Yeah. Right. Whether it's tennis or pickleball. It's, for me, it's pickleball yeah. uh, in this case. But it's so hard to like watch yourself and and being like, oh, like that's not good. Yeah. Me, right. And it, yeah. it takes it takes um it takes a certain level of like maybe like maturity or whatever it is yeah. to be like okay this is exactly why i'm losing points yeah but then on the other hand you have to have the needs and the wants to be like okay i'm losing points because i'm not quick enough mm -hmm. let me get off the weights and now i'm gonna go to you know a track or whatever mm -hmm. maybe some stairs and encinitas right yeah and i'm just gonna do this until i can't do it anymore yeah and then I'm going to come back tomorrow and do it again. And that's almost even harder, right? Like yeah. recognizing it, it's hard because it's, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to, a lot of times we don't want to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, me specifically. <laughs> but then also being like, okay, doing something that you're not actually good at, it's yeah. what really sucks. But at the same time is what's really making you better. Yeah. You know? And I think a lot of that, again, is trial and error. I, I definitely made mistakes in my career and I, I would 
but it wasn't mistakes that I regret. It's mistakes that I had to make to figure out, okay, that was too much or that was not quite enough or that was too much running and not enough agility or that was too much agility and not enough running or what I need to do. So I think a lot of that is figuring, figuring that out. And nowadays I do think it's, it's not easier, but it's more accessible to have more film on yourself, to have more um, sort of tips. And I think pickleball, especially since it's such a kind of a new, it's not a new sport, but it's kind of new in the professional ranks um, to have this kind of, um, talent in it. So I think in five and 10 years, it's going to be amazing to see the difference in how much people have done a lot of trial and error. And okay, this is what works for the best players in the world. Like what's, what do they have in common? What have the, what have their training methods, um, really, where's the overlap there and what hasn't worked? What has, where have you seen where men and women are getting worse? What are they, what are they doing that they're not, they're not showing that level of improvement? Cause I think, it's fun for me to see. I mean, the game of tennis has gotten so much better in the last 30 years and to see what the game of pickleball is going to be like in the next 10, 20, 30 years to see the difference in level of training and what they're doing. Because, I mean, I, I think in 10 years, there's going to be quite a few people out on tour that are traveling with their own trainers, with their own PTs, with their own nutrition, and just to see um, what makes them better. And, and like you said, there's so much that goes into it. Um, and there are just those little things as opposed to the actual skill and that, that, um, that talent and everything involved, but everything else is going to make a big difference in people, are, especially as the money gets bigger and bigger. That always al also helps is you've got the ability nowadays in tennis, you've got the top, I don't know, 60, 80 guys are all traveling with their own PTs, their own coaches, some of them with their own psychologists because the money's gotten so much bigger. So that's, and you see that in the fact that the product on court is getting better. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and you pro you could probably attest to this, like part of the reason why you did so well uh, in tennis was because you worked really hard to have a team around you mm -hmm. that is not only taking care of you, but also truly cares about you. Yeah, right? yeah, I was really lucky. That's a good point. Is I had uh, Brian Barker, who was my coach since I was uh, 12, 11 or 12 years old. And then when I went out on tour, um, it was great because he knew my game better than anyone. He knew me better than anyone. And we were both kind of like learning the tour together because um, he had traveled a little bit with Matt V Lander, but he hadn't been like a full time on tour coach. And then that was what we learned together. And it was a ton of fun, but I knew he was still the best person for the X's and O's for me and the best person because I think a coach is really valuable to have someone that can um, understand what needs to be said, what doesn't need to be said and how to relay the information. He was the best person in the world at getting information that I needed to hear to me. Um, because a lot of other people I think would have tried different methods with coaching me. And I know now, especially looking back that it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> I was at that age, I was too stubborn. I wouldn't have listened or I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done a lot of the things, um, that I knew we had already tried. And with, with Brian, we had tried so many things. And that's like I said, I love trial and error. So we did so many things in practice and then I, you know, I'd go out and play a match and then get criticized by, uh, by someone in the media, like, Oh, we should have tried this. And then Brian and I would sit back and laugh like, I just tried that for three weeks straight in practice and I was just terrible at it. So I'm not going to go out in there and do it in a match and guarantee that I'm going to lose. Um, but they're saying I need to try this. Like they think a lot of times people think like you, you're just doing the same thing over and over. We tried everything. So um, I, I, I was very lucky to have Brian um, I, and I'm very, very, very aware that if I was, if it wasn't for Brian Barker, there's no way I would have been four in the world. There's no way I would have, I, I don't believe I would have even had a, uh, an extremely successful pro career because he made that much of a difference in getting me to that level. So um, there is some some level of importance there. And I think for pickleball, that's going to become more and more of a thing. Yeah. So hypothetically, <laughs> why would it take what would it take for you considering, you know, your knowledge, everything you can bring from tennis mm -hmm. uh, to the pickleball court? Uh, for you to like go on the road or something or maybe <laughs> coach uh, somebody like me yeah <laughs> um, well I don't think I'd have the I don't think I'd have the wherewithal to coach in pickleball yet until I, I would have to do so much research I think and learn watch so much video and figure out um, a lot more of the nuances of the game I mean in tennis that was 25 30 years of my life of, of spending time uh, spending time doing that so I, I'd have much more of a, uh, a path to doing that but in pickleball um, I don't know. I just think to be a good coach as well, you have to spend real time with the player. And that means practice time. That means, uh, time, uh, for the matches and traveling with them and everything. And 
I got two little girls at home and I just can't imagine being on the road like that again. I, a few people have uh, have joked about me that I'm going to go play some pickleball and mm-hmm. play some torrents and stuff. And every time when my wife's around, she's like, what are you doing? Absolutely not. He's not <laughs> going back on the road. And I mean, we're always just joking. But um, I, I just think I, I know I'm on borrowed time right now with the fact that my daughters are 11 and 10 and they still like me right now. And I, I can't imagine going away for too long to be away when I know in two or three years, they're going to think I'm like the least cool person in the world and not want to spend time around me. So I better enjoy it now when, uh, when I get them from school later today, they're going to want to play in the backyard with me. And two years from now, I know that's not going to be the case. So I'm going to enjoy it. And uh, maybe in a few years, if, if someone wanted me to coach, then it, it might be reasonable when they want to get me out of the house. But right now I can't imagine being on the road like that. Yeah, it's tough, right? I just had my baby girl. Congrats. Born. Thank you. So two, exciting. Yeah, two weeks ago. And I mean, even just doing this, I'm like, OK, yeah, bye. You got to get home. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah. uh, I, I totally get it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier uh, about, you know, you had your first baby girl while mm-hmm. you were on tour. Yeah. And did the second one, was it after second, you retired? Second one was, uh, my wife was due right after I retired. So she was pregnant when I was, uh, when I finished my career. And, um, you know, a lot of things came into my decision to retire. Um, we knew we wanted to have another kid. Um, and I was, like I said, my body was starting to really fail me. And that was struggle. Cause like I said, I love getting better. And I, I always thought that when I get to a point in my tennis career where I don't feel like I'm getting better, And I also don't feel like I can win an event when I go into it. Um, Then maybe it's time to stop. And that was all coming to to one point because I felt like that year in 2013, um, at the beginning of the year, I I, by Australia, I'd already made the decision like this is going to be my last. I didn't tell anyone except for my wife, but I didn't tell anyone that until um, it got to the U.S. Open. But um, the reason was every tournament I played that year, I felt like, okay, first round, I can beat anyone. I could, you know, not that I did, but I I felt in my, you know, when I'm stepping on the court, I feel like I can win this match. Second round. Okay. I still feel good. By the time I got to the third round and, um, I played two matches already and no matter what, like just, it's different tension, different, you know, your body is just breaking down from all the nerves and the pressure. And then I got to that third round and I felt like, you know what, I'm at maybe 90%. And I can't win on tour at 90%. I have to be 100% or at least 98% to be able to win these matches against this level of players. So realistically, I would have to have unbelievable luck to get to a finals in my, you know, at that point in my career. So um, to do that and not feel like I could go a full week of playing really healthy and, you know, top level tennis, it made it so, okay, it's it's probably time to be done. And I, and I can't get better because even when I train to get my body back, my body starts breaking down and I need to get back to kind of neutral and get on the table and get worked on. And so it was just, it was all coming together at that point say, you know what, it's, it's time to be done. And now we're going to, you know, we we're we're very lucky. We got pregnant and uh, I know that's wrong. We didn't get pregnant. She got pregnant. (laughs) I, uh, (laughs) she did all the actual work. (laughs) Um, But then, you know, so she's pregnant and now, okay, well, it it wasn't going to make sense to travel with two, two babies anyway. So, this is perfect timing. It actually gave me, like I said earlier, like I understand why people have struggles to go from being an athlete to be a former athlete. There was zero struggle for me because as soon as I was off tour, uh, my daughter, my, my oldest daughter was one, one and a half. Uh, my wife was pregnant. So at that point, pretty pregnant <laughs> and very tired. And mm-hmm. she had been a rock star for doing everything uh, the year before when I was traveling <clears throat> still and, and she was traveling with our daughter and she was, I mean, she was connected at the hip with her. They did everything together and she did, she put zero stress on me for what I needed to do. And then day after I retired, it was okay, here you go. Um, you've got, you got, you're on daddy duty. And <laughs> it went straight from, I always joked that I went from basically like the most, in my opinion, the most selfish, um, sort of career you could have to the most selfless, you know, g- going from where everything has to be about you when you're on tour, your schedule, when you're eating, when you're napping, when you're training, when you're sleeping, when you're doing everything, uh, when you're doing your training, when you're doing your PT and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you go from that where it's all about you getting the most out of your performance to absolutely nothing is about you. It's all about that kid. And, you know, at that point you're dealing with babies. So you're in the stage where it's, uh, it's physical, you know, all they all you're doing is worrying about their schedule. When are they supposed to eat? When are they supposed to sleep? You know, is that diaper wet? You know, what do I need to do? (laughs) And all you're doing is that. And I still remember, like, as soon as I retired, now I'm full on in this and 
I would joke with my wife. I'm like, I forgot to eat lunch today. I don't even know what happened. I fed her every time, but then I, I forgot that I was supposed to do that. And I, and then I just realized, you know, it's six o'clock at night and I, I didn't take my morning shower yet. Like what, what happened? Like I, I'm not even like paying attention to what I'm doing. It's all about them. And it was, so it made the transition so easy to yeah. go from like, all right, you know, I don't need to care about tennis anymore. I don't need to care about m what I was doing. It's so much fun to be a part of a family now where I'm, I'm, responsible for this you know baby and then soon to come another baby and now i need to tag team with my wife because once it goes from one to two um people that tell you it's not a big difference they're just lying and telling you to get you know <laughs> they want misery loves company or whatever but it it becomes so much more of an endeavor when you've got one on one schedule one on a different schedule they're on different nap schedules and you just never have any free time in those moments but it's uh, but it's a joyous not having free time and i still remember talking to my wife a lot about this is that I'd get to the end of the day when we got two little kids, two babies, and you're just exhausted. But it's just a different kind of tired because I mean, every every day when I was on tour, you you know you have five hours of practice, you got footwork drills, you got all this kind of stuff. You come home, you're tired. But I told her I still remember like some of those days with the with the with the two little girls. Like you're just more. It's a different kind of like bone tired from just being go 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 and the like the tension of like i need to keep these babies alive is my biggest job right mm -hmm. now and you have to do it at all the time so it was uh it was just a fun transition to go that that I, it gave me the opportunity to kind of forget about tennis for a while yeah and it's it's unbelievable because obviously i mean i could i could i can see that both you and i had really lucky to have found somebody that's just that cool right yeah. like they're yeah. just they're just amazing human beings and you're mm -hmm. around them and that's all you want to do right and then yeah. you're like okay i guess i'll go practice yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know but yeah. once once my fiance got pregnant and then you know the nine months after and the birth like mm. you in my opinion at least like i had these new like i mean i always respect her always loved her but mm. then watching her for nine ten months go through all of that it almost gives you like another like sense of like respect and love and all the stuff like i could never do that <laughs> absolutely and, and uh, <laughs> i think um it's my my father-in-law would always say like well thank goodness it's uh, it's the women that have the babies because if it was men that had babies the the, the population would go to zero <laughs> real fast because we would just never do it again but um yeah I, I definitely gained so much uh love and respect for my wife going through that because she had two pretty tough pregnancies um and it's it, it is so difficult that's why i say we didn't get pregnant she did all the work um, and it's, it is really, uh, really incredible what, what they go through and seeing how much they sacrifice. And, um, yeah, I mean, going through tennis, you, you know, you live in locker rooms, you know, mm -hmm. my whole career, basically like you're, you're with a bunch of men that have very, um, there's definitely some, you know, there's locker room talk and a lot of it can be seen in the, the generations past as being pretty sexist. And now for me to have to see what, what women go through on a day-to-day -day basis and having two daughters, it makes me, um, it makes me hopeful that to see how far it's progressed since I was first on tour to seeing now, um, a lot of the players and how much they, they respect women athletes, how much they respect women in general. Um, um, I'm speaking only of tennis cause that's what I know, but I don't know about in other, in other sports and other locker rooms, but, um, to see that respect is something that's fun. And I, and my wife uh, definitely told me as soon as we found out that um, we were having a girl with our first one, she said, well, like, I actually think that's good for you. You need to be softened up a little. So, it, <laughs> and it's, it's true. It's definitely softened me up having into having two girls, but um, yeah, you, you definitely have a newfound respect and appreciation for, for everything women go through. And um, also, yes, you're right. It makes you uh, realize that you can do it and you wouldn't want, <laughs> you wouldn't want to have to go through the, the torture that they go through for nine months. And also, I mean, my, like I said, my wife had two tough pregnancies and I don't understand these people and couples that have eight kids or six kids or whatever to go through <laughs> just to go through the pregnancy that many times. Cause, um, I know there are some that have it much easier, um, in the, during the pregnancy time, uh, during those times where they're pregnant, but I couldn't imagine, um, with how tough it was, uh, for my wife. So more power to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I want, I want one of each, hopefully yeah. so I want a boy and a girl, right. one girl and a boy now. Yeah. And then if we have another girl, so two girls and I want to try one more time <laughs> to see if I can get a boy. And if I get three girls, that's totally cool. Uh, but I, I would love to have one of each just to kind of have that, um, you know, different experience with them. Right. Yeah. If I get, if I get lucky or, you know, however you want to yeah. uh, go about it. But yeah, let's, uh, let's transition a little bit into pickleball. Yeah. Um, cause you know, that's what I do. Yeah. Um, 
How old were you when you retired? I was 33. Okay, so 33, uh, retired from tennis, mm-hmm. bathing your hands. Yep. Um, at what point do you find pickleball? At what point are you like, wow, I kind of like this thing? Yeah, I found pickleball. It was a real slow burn at first. I didn't, I didn't just like pick it up and be like, oh, I, I got to play this all the time. I, I first learned of it actually from my mom um, because my mom played tennis her whole life, and you know, I used to play tennis with her, and then – um, she would play in her senior center. Uh, she played pickleball. Um, uh, and so she one time took me there in Connecticut. This is pre COVID. Uh, I guess that the place kind of shut down during COVID, but before COVID. So she's like, Oh, you got to meet some of my friends. I go there and I play pickleball and it's great. And so I went and I watched her play. And then she's like, why don't you come play? I'm like, well, I don't think this is really fair. I'm playing <laughs> against a bunch of 75 year olds and, you know, no offense to them, but I can move a little better. And, yeah. Um, so I played with her and just like, you know, kind of learning the game and I was like, oh, that's fun. And I actually thought I was like, this is absolutely perfect. My wife, uh, my mom gets, you know, social, um, you know, interaction. She gets, um, she gets to use her tennis skills that she used her whole life. She doesn't have to worry about as much movement. They can play indoors. They played on like a gym. And I was like, this is an unbelievable game, um, for my mom specifically because she gets (laughs) to use all, I was like, this is perfect. Like, and I, other than that, I didn't know much about it. And so I was like, okay, that's great. You know, absolutely perfect. Mom, I'll come some other time and watch you play and hang with your friends. And that's great. And I move out here to San Diego. That was when I was living in Connecticut. So I moved out here to, to San Diego. And then there's a bunch of people that are saying they, you know, that are my age that are playing. Yeah. And they're like, oh, come on over. I had a friend that had a court at his house and said, let's go, let's play. You know, all the couples come over and, and play. And that was the first time I played with people my age. And they made, they said, okay, ever, you know, I think they had eight couples. They're going to do a little tournament, but everyone's having drinks. It's fun. I said, but James, you have to play lefty. So what? I've, I've never played this sport in my life. Like, how come you're going to make me play lefty? Like, and, you know, I think you're going to trans, uh, transition pretty quickly to being able to be pretty good at it. So first tournament I ever played was, it wasn't a tournament. It was, uh, you know, having drinks with a bunch of couples and, uh, they made me play lefty. So I, I first learned how to play lefty. Um, but then, I just realized like a few other people wanted to get me into it and wanted me to play. So I started playing a little more and a little more. And then, um, it became fun because I, the people I was learning from, I started like, okay, am I good enough to play with them? And then, you know, a month or two later, I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm beating them and okay, now I get to a different level. And then I still remember, I think I played with you at Riggs one time, um, just one game and I was awful and I was by far the weak link on the court. And I was like, all right, well, you know, a long way to go. Like, that's, that's fun to see, like, how good these guys are. And then I started playing with, um, with Steve Dawson, mm-hmm. Callan's dad, who's great. Uh, and, you know, I play with him and other people kind of his level as well. And, you know, again, weak link. I was the, by far the weak link and then just trying to figure out. And then I'd play with just some people playing very, rec- you know, very recreational games. And as I started playing, once I got into, like, an actual rhythm of playing once a week, or twice a week and learning a little more of the game, I could see like, all right, now I'm getting better and better and better. And that became, then it became way more fun. And now then I don't feel as bad and, um, drilling and playing with guys like you and guys like Callen. And, and I don't feel like I'm totally the weak link, which is a ton of fun just to be out there playing with you guys and not feel like I'm making things worse. Like it, it's actually fun for me to, to go out with you guys and feel like I'm helping you guys get better. Um, which is, you know, which is great. I, I love, uh, I love that feeling. Yeah, and I mean, I love Steve. I love Callan, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've I've known them for so long. I yeah. the first time I met both of them, Jennifer as well, Tyler, yeah. the whole family was back in 2013. Yeah, and I'm actually having Callan over today as well. Oh, uh, nice for a little pod. Um, but yeah, when I started playing pickleball, it was back in 2018, 2017, 2018, and yeah. Steve and Callan were unbelievable. Yeah, and it did not matter what I did. Like they would just like freeze at the ball, yeah, perfectly into the kitchen, right? Yeah. And back in the day, where there was there was no grit on on the paddles, you right. couldn't really apply any spin. So Callum was like literally the best like <laughs> yeah. pickleball player. Like, yeah. What is going on? Why can it not get to this guy? <laughs> Try to hit a hard the ball goes into the net, right? Because you yeah. can't put any spin on it. Um, but yeah, they've always been. Both of them have always been so like almost like gracious, right? Like yeah. if that's if that's the word, like Definitely. they're they're always trying to help yeah they're always nice to you they're it doesn't matter who you are yeah I mean, if you're james blake <laughs> Mita young or joe schmo right yeah. like they're just yeah. they're great they're just such a good family um what i wanted to ask you is you had a one-hander in tennis yeah right and pickleball it's always been kind of known that you only use one hand right you use like 
forehand, mm -hmm. use your one hand for punches and whatever. Mm -hmm. But more recently, over the past couple of years, people have been developing a two-hander. Yeah. Now, I know your goal is not quite to play pro, <laughs> and so for you to develop a two-hander, it's yeah. whatever, right? But do you think it was better for you to come from tennis to pickleball with a because you had a one-hander, or do you wish you had a second hand on it? Like, what are your thoughts on I that? I mean, watching um, some of the best pickleball players in the world now, I do wish I had a two-hander because mm -hmm. it looks so natural. The roll, especially the up at the kitchen line, to have that little, like, roll dink yeah. um, is really great. <laughs> and then I, I haven't played much singles, but the few times I have, I feel like I need to have that two-handed drive because it's so difficult with a one-hander. I think, you know, McGuffin does it, right? But he just runs around and hits all forehands pretty much. Most of the time it's forehands. What, what Tyson does really well uh, with one hand at the kitchen line is rolling the shot. So most people yeah. use two yeah. hands to yeah. roll, but he's able to reach in, apply some topspin, or even off the bounds. It's more of a push dink, but he's still yeah. applying a little bit of topspin. Yeah. But most people don't do that, right? Yeah. Most people so, use the two. Yeah, so I do I do wish I had the two, and, and as I'm working on getting better, it's something that I'd be more open to, to trying that, and that's going to take – like you said, Steve's so nice. Like I might pull him out there mm -hmm. and get him out there at rigs and be like, Hey, can you actually help me to develop a two hander and, and get that roll to it? Because I, I could never do it in tennis. I switched really young, uh, in tennis to a one hander too young, probably because I was stubborn and my brother was switching and I said, I'm strong enough. I can do it. And I was <laughs> foolish because I wasn't strong enough to do it when I did. But, um, but yeah, so I think it would be it would be a little bit of a, a stretch for me to try it. But if I took some time and I'm so new to pickleball still that I, if I if I did work on it, I think maybe I'd be able to develop it and and that'd be a lot of fun and feel like okay, I'm now I'm I'm also getting better at something else. And um, it's just for me like to hear that and to hear that what the difference was in 2017, 2018 in pickleball to now, mm -hmm. the difference in the paddles, how much grit they made, and like I'm sure the balls are going to change, the technology, the the shoes always changes and um, there's going to be so much that it's, it's fun to see. I, I'd be curious to know what you think it's going to look like five years from now. Like, are they going to stop with some of the technology advances? Because I feel like some of the paddles are getting <laughs> a little more and more dangerous with the, I mean, they turn into rocket ships. So, yeah, it is interesting, right? Because I, I think when, when you see all these sports evolve, mm -hmm. right? Like when you look back at it, mm -hmm. they make sense. Yeah. Right. Especially with like tennis rackets. Um, the issue is that I didn't live through those times. Yeah. So I don't know if it made sense when they were developing new tennis rackets. Yeah. You know, I don't know if they were like, this is too powerful. This yeah. is, you know, how can you hit so much stuff with this? Yeah. So I don't know what that looked like back then. So the thing with pickleball now that I'm like living through it, it's so hard to pinpoint what it will look like. Yeah. Because it doesn't it doesn't feel right. Right, right? now it doesn't feel right, right, right? Like you shouldn't have people always having a worry that they're going to lose an eye when they're playing, Yeah. right? You shouldn't have such a discrepancy in how good a paddle is. Yeah. You know, like I go play, luckily I'm with Engage, mm -hmm. right? Like they're, they make good paddles. Yeah. But if you're with, I don't want to name drop anybody, <laughs> but if you're with somebody yeah. else and yeah. your paddle is just not up to, you know, whatever they're making nowadays, yeah. like your chances of winning are so much lower even yeah. if you're a better player than me like the paddle just makes such a big difference yeah. right and so many of us i'm fortunate enough that engage treats me really well mm -hmm. so if i'm like hey can i get nine paddles mm -hmm. they send me nine paddles right right and nowadays it's the power but it's also the grit yeah so playing with new paddles in my opinion is extremely important because you get you always like the day of the tournament you always get that fresh feeling of like the poppiness yeah. The grid on it, right? How much spin you can put. Um, if you play, if I play even with an engaged paddle as good as they are, and I'm like two months in and I'm playing against a brand new, um, let's say, Yola, mm -hmm. it's going to have more spin than mine. Like, yeah. You know, you don't have to be a complete genius to, like, yeah. you know, figure that out. So to answer your question, I don't know what it's going to look like in five years. I think the game should and will get faster mm -hmm. um but i hope that we're all playing to somewhat of uh you know within within the same capabilities of yeah you know the paddles are similar right yeah. the amount of spin that we can put in the ball is similar yeah. and it's really at that point it's really more on the player than it is about the paddle yeah right yeah um now i hope that it doesn't get that much more powerful yeah uh, i think speed is fine but you can add speed with spin as well right mm -hmm. you can speed more balls up the more great you have um 
but the idea of just having, uh, you know, as many body bags as we're as we're seeing nowadays, or people serving hard and cracking forehands and hitting somebody in the chest with it, like I yeah. just don't think it's as fun to watch. Yeah. Um, but to shoot it right back at you, like, what's in your opinion? And I think we can all agree, pickleball is not the most fun to watch on <laughs> on, on TV yeah. yet. Yeah. Like, wh what would it take, right? Like, let's say we're five years down the road. Mm -hmm. What would make you uh, want to watch Pickleball more often? Or what would make somebody... Actually, let's just answer that one. First. Yeah, well, I, for me, I think I agree that there's a lot of people that think it's not as not as entertaining to watch on TV. Mm -hmm. But for me, I to say, like, what would make me want to watch it? I actually do want to watch it now. I enjoy it because I've started playing with uh, with a lot of you guys and seeing the level and the skill and the nuance. So for me, it's fun. So my hope is that for the rise of pickleball is that the more players that come into the game, the more recreational players, because I don't think that's going anywhere. Pickleball will, in my opinion, forever be a great recreational sport. There will always be people that want to play it. Um, it's so accessible. The barrier to entry is as low as any other sport, I think. So um, that will always be there. But the more people that get involved in it at the recreational level will want to see what the top level really looks like. And that's the way I feel when now I've getting, I'm getting better. I want to see, okay, well, how are the pros doing it? And what can I do to still improve? And what can I learn from them? So for me, I think it's, it's just a matter of getting more recreational players into it and hope they enjoy it. And then on a bigger level, I think for a lot of those, pro, a lot of those recreational players that don't have as much interest or aren't maybe as competitive as me or aren't like really wanting to study it the way I might... Um, I think the big thing is is getting stars involved and yeah. seeing the personalities and seeing those matchups. So I think, you know, um, the the major league pickleball format I think is great because it's got teams and there's a, a, it's so young that they're not really there yet. But once they get some rivalries and they get some storylines and some interest between uh, between teams that don't like each other or players that don't like each other and they're playing with not their normal partner and how are they going to adapt to that? How are they going to adjust? So having storylines and actual stars, Jack Sock coming into the game, I think is really great um, because you've got a, uh, you know, he's already got a built-in fan base that liked him as a tennis player and now they're seeing how is he going to relate to pickleball players and the the diehard pickleball people are going to say, well, is he kind of a, uh, is he really one of us or is he uh, is he just a tennis player that's having fun playing pickleball? Is he really working on it? So I think having stars involved is going to help. Um, and then it's um, it's getting, you know, longer and longer into it, getting those rivalries and getting some sort of storyline involved. And, you know, I think for the last year or so, a lot of it has just been, can anyone beat Ben and Anna Lee? You know, and um, maybe um, once there are some some real rivalries uh, involved there, whether it's like tennis where there ends up being a big three, you know, are there going to be three or four that are really competing every week for, for uh, the, the biggest titles? And then I think figuring out the schedule of how you can differentiate the really big events mm -hmm. from the smaller events. And I know they're trying that with the thousands and 500s and stuff. So I think when you get that and you don't have the same players at, at every week, and so then, okay, you know, Andre Dayaski is doing great in this event, but, you know, but Ben wasn't at this one. So wait a minute, Andre's getting better. Is Ben getting better? Who's going to, who's going to come out on top? And then, you know, you haven't heard from someone else in any of these same events. So getting them all together at one will make those big events seem bigger. I think so. There's going to be a lot to figure out, but that's where um, hopefully the scheduling comes in. Hopefully the, the higher ups in the sport, figure out the, the best path. But I think it's unfortunately the last, I don't know, six months to a year have been too uh, muddied by a lot of fighting, a lot of infighting <laughs> yeah. with those higher ups. And, and, and now with the merger, hopefully everything is, is copacetic and they can just, everyone can work on getting the, the sport and the product uh, better for everyone. Yeah. And I would agree that when it comes to watching pickleball, mm -hmm. I personally enjoy watching it. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's somebody that I, you know, truly enjoy, you know, whether, whether it's their pickleball game or whether it's like their personality. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I like watching Augie Gee play, mm -hmm. you know, I, I love lefties. I like watching Pablo play, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, it's fun and refreshing to watch somebody like Pablo have that emotion yeah. uh, on court, right? Like we're, it seems like because Ben wins so much and he's so good that a lot of the people that come into the game are like, okay, I need to be just like Ben. Yeah. Right. And then they come in and they try to think like Ben Dings and they try to have like some, like that sort of demeanor that Ben has. Mm -hmm. And as good as Ben is, like, I understand why you would want to mimic all of that. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, you're never going to be as good as someone that you're trying to be like. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think it would be really important for a lot of the players that are coming into the sport, uh, you know, whether you're playing for a year or two or whether you're brand new mm -hmm. to, yeah, you can pick up a couple of shots here and there, but like just be yourself. Absolutely. Right. And we'll get into the MLP PPA stuff and the <laughs> merger. That'll be, that'll be kind of fun to talk about. Um, but what are your, th what are your thoughts on pickleball right now being overplayed? Right. Because, you have, like you were saying, like you have all these tournaments, mm -hmm. so many weekends out mm -hmm. of the year, and you have people like me. I'm, you know, 24. I really don't get that tired. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on 30 weekends in a row. I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. It's like it mm -hmm. doesn't matter to me that much. I enjoy it, right? It's part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like, you know, especially like let's say now you have, you had North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to Houston. Uh, we're going to, uh, Los Cab up in Fountain Valley, mm -hmm. followed by St. George. Everything is back to back to back mm -hmm. to back, right? And it seems like as a professional that you're trying to be in the top 20, top 15, top 10, you do really have to play every single one. Otherwise, yeah. you don't have a chance. Yeah. Because if there was a tournament that was, you know, of way lower points than it is now, then you could skip it, mm -hmm. right? But I think we just ha like every tournament right now, uh, it's basically the same thing, right? Like you're getting a little more upsets right now, which I mm -hmm. think it also has to do with being beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's like, OK, we go to here, Ben wins triple crown. And then the next week, Ben wins double crown. Mm -hmm. and next week, Anna Lee and Ben win triple crown, right? Yeah. So it's and it happens so often that I feel like it's almost getting a little bit diluted. Yeah. And I think that's where there could actually be a benefit to being so new and following up um, what other leagues have done that have worked and what hasn't worked. Cause I mean, <laughs> I, I get that if there's a tournament every single week, it does get to the point where it feels like this is just, you know, repetitive. It's groundhog day. Um, but if you look at the ATP tour, there's, there is a tournament every week. It's just that the players aren't always playing every week. You know, there's, there's a tournament from the first week of the year through mid November uh, on the ATP tour. But, you still know the Grand Slams are important because everyone has to play those. You know the Masters 1000s are important because everyone has to play those. All the others in between, it's pick and choose. You can play them or you cannot. You can rest. You can make those decisions. So, and then you're not seeing those matchups. I mean, even in the you know the biggest days of the say Roger Rafa rivalry, very rarely they didn't actually play each other that often. Uh, in the course of one year and you got that when they did play each other it was so important because that was only in a grand slam final or it's only in a masters 1000 final but they were able to pick and choose their um their tournaments and with that you get it so that you can see okay so someone's doing really well in these little events are they going to be able to translate that into a grand slam are they going to be able to do well when it is against the top players uh, against the you know when they're all together uh, you know, they've got the ability to have one big upset because there was one name in one of these little events and they got that one upset. But can they do it back to back when they have to beat three of the guys in the top 10 to win a Masters 1000? You know, things like that. So it, it can still build even though there's going to be tournaments every week. Um, but I think they can learn from, you know, same with the PGA Tour. There's tournaments every weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, you still know Masters week is coming up. Everyone wants to be there. Everyone wants to have that one on their resume. So um, the best players are in those and maybe the best players aren't at the Valero open. You know, it's, it's okay, but you've got three or four big names. Um, so I think there's got to be a way for them to learn from the fact that you can still have a lot of events, but you don't have to have it feel like groundhog day because you can't have your top players playing that many events. And I don't know how you want to, how they want to limit that. I mean, I know in tennis, a lot of it has to do with appearance fees for the top players. Um, they're not going to show up at a lot of these little events because they're not getting paid at a lot of those little events. And at the bigger, at the, the little events, they've got a budget for one of the top 10 and they're going to pay that. So um, that's why they end up happening that way. I don't know what the, the um, solution is in pickleball. Cause I know um, there's probably not the same level of money as there was in the ATP WTA and PGA tour um, for finding out ways to make that schedule work. But I just think there has to be a way of, like you said, not having it be, it's every week. It's Ben and Anna Lee. Then it's Ben and Anna Lee. Then it's, you, you have to have them, um, you know, really come to to having a big event at a Grand Slam or at a, a big, you know, at, when they when they win, it's got to be really, really valuable as opposed to them winning every little event uh, along the way. 
Yeah, so basically what I'm hearing is you can still have the same amount of tournaments, right? Mm -hmm. But making sure that the schedule is made in a way where if you have a major, 2,000 mm -hmm. points, the next one is not impeccable would be 1,500, right? Yeah. Like you want it to be like a 250. Yeah. See, and, and impeccable, uh, we just don't have that. It's like we yeah. have three back-to-back, 1,000 points, and then the next one is 2,000, the next one is 1,500. So it's like how are you supposed to keep, skip any? There's yeah. so many points, right? Yeah. We're in tennis. And I don't know exactly how it works, but, you know, you might have the major. And then if you're somewhat maybe top 100 or so, you can skip to 250. Yeah. Or you can go play if you want to, but somebody like you was like, okay, well, I don't need to, so I'm going to train yeah. this week. Yeah. Come back stronger uh, the next week. Maybe it's like a Masters 1000, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I totally get that. But um, talk to me a little bit about... Uh, MLP, right? So yeah. you were originally an owner. Yeah, were. It's, were. Uh, it's uh, now past tense. <laughs> yeah. And you guys bought the team back in 2023? Uh, no, it was earlier than that, I think. Wasn't it 2022, I think? 2022. I don't. So I played. Cause, okay. So let's go. And it started in 2023, but we yeah. we had already, or maybe we, it officially started in 2023. But yeah, we've had it for about, I mean, we had it for about two years. Right. Because you play, you were part of the lions yeah i was back uh, in 2022 yeah, 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 and then the lions and then did that transition that into the mashers, the, the mashers. Yeah. okay so by the team in 2022 did yeah. that season with mlp yeah went on to converting that into the milwaukee, milwaukee mashers. Mashers. when we started we were the lions but then they started affiliating um teams with a city yeah. and so we wanted to be and they they asked a lot of the owners like okay where would you like to be everyone wanted to be la everyone wanted to be new york and my co-owner was Mark Lazary, and he owned the Milwaukee Bucks at the time. And so we said, you know what, let's, you know, just make it easier and let's be in Milwaukee. My wife's also from Milwaukee, which happens to be a, just a random coincidence. But so I was like, OK, let's be Milwaukee. No one else is, you know, is really clamoring to have the Milwaukee team. Mm -hmm. So let's do Milwaukee. And we're like, but Milwaukee Lions doesn't really fit. So yeah. we figured out, OK, let's do something else. And we did the, the play on words of the Milwaukee Mashers. Yeah, I do remember. I also remember getting that first phone call. Um, <laughs> it was the 2023 season one premiere yeah. uh, draft, and you guys drafted, I believe, Cali first. Yep. Then it went on to Lucy, Lucy. and I think yeah. it was back to back picks. Yep. And then, like always, not always because of this uh, last draft, but Andre ended up falling into the third round, which yeah. is always in my, it's always ridiculous, right? <laughs> yeah. The, guy, the yeah. guy, the guy just knows how to win. Yeah, like he's absolutely. so good. Um, and then I was, then I was like lucky, lucky enough to get <laughs> into the um, fall into the fourth fourth round pick for, with yeah. you guys with the Milwaukee Mashers. Yeah, and yeah, we ended up going into the first three. Uh, ev Two events, I was with you guys, then I got traded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I got traded to the Pandas. Yeah. Uh, I tell myself that you did, not because of my skill level, but because <laughs> Matt made a lot more sense with Lucy than I than I did. Exactly. Um, I might have had a little bit of resentment for about <laughs> three seconds after the phone call, and I was like, okay, you know, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Um, and then move forward the second season – you guys redrafted me again, yeah. which was hilarious, <laughs> back in the Season 2 Challenger. So Challenger, yeah. And then I was, I think, overall third pick. Yeah. And then, you know, I get that phone call from Mikey. <laughs> I, I yeah. love Mikey. We still talk to this day. Yeah. A uh, phone call from Mikey. Hey, man, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did that go about? So, yeah. obviously, I play for you guys in Premiere. Yeah. I get drafted. No resentment there. I know yeah. Matt made way more sense than yeah. me, especially because they play... Uh, Matt does a really good job. Matt Rye, for you know, yeah. those who don't know, on the right, it men's doubles. And yeah. then him and Lucy play exclusively together. Yeah. Um, and then you guys end up redrafting me and and uh Challenger. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, so the whole story, it's I've I, I loved my time uh as uh as an owner and of being part of the MLP and how it started and getting going. And um so initially our first thought, because it's so new, the first like kind of bigger draft was we had, I think it was like the 11th pick. So we had like 11 and 14 were our picks. So we were almost back to back. And so uh, my initial thought when I was talking to Alex Lazary, who was also helping Mark Lazary's son, and we were talking about it, I was like, you know what? I just think when we got that pick, it's not one of the top picks. So it's not Ben. It's not Anna Lee. It's not um, Riley. Or, so what we're going to do is I think we're going to target the best female we can get because we thought, you know, if we let that drop, 
the difference in level and skill level from the top women to like the 20th and 30th and 40th women. I thought I was like, you know what, that's too big. And if we can get, a, you know, a, a male player later in the draft, like they're still able to, I feel like there were still young players that were getting better. And I still like that, you know, players in the third and fourth round on the men's side, they had the ability to beat some of the top men. And I didn't think it was the same. So I'm like, all right, so we get the, the first pick we get is Callie. Great. And then we're like, we're just a few picks away. And she normally plays with Lucy and they're one of the best teams on the PPA. If we can get them together, man, we could have a dominant women's team and then we could work. Or with so the, you thought. So we thought. <laughs> so this is like just going through the thinking. It was like, okay, if we can get them together, like this is amazing. So we got that. We thought they were great. And then again, like you said, how does Andre slip all the way to the third round? And I remember this really well because I was actually on a flight. I was doing a charity event um, in the Bahamas and flying back at the time, and I'm just getting on board, and I'm texting furiously with, with Alex Rasley, and he said, Andre dropped. I was like, okay, my, my goodness, this is incredible. We got Andre. We got Andre. This is great. I'm still I'm about to like board the flight, and then, again, it's just like a couple picks later, and they were like, um, okay, who, who do we got? And there's a few options. I was like, wait a minute. Did you say DJ is still available? Mm-hmm. Like, we're done. We're getting DJ. We got DJ. Let's get DJ. If we can have DJ, Andre, and these, I mean, and the, the women, that, you know, we've got an unbelievable team. We got DJ and I got on my, fl- on my flight. I was, couldn't have been happier. I slept really well on that flight <laughs> and uh, coming home like, all right, we got a great team. And then you're right. That, I mean, it was surprising that Callie and Lucy didn't dominate the way we expected them because you think they play week in, week out together and they do really well. So now they're playing a bunch of teams that are just put together kind of haphazardly. They're not, you know, usual partners. They should really, you know, breeze through a lot of these and they just didn't. They, they struggled a little. And again, that is why it went into the decision making of the trade was like, you know, maybe Lucy wasn't that happy. You know, she's obviously plays with M- Matt most of the, you know, exclusively. So she, we felt like, all right, she wanted Matt on the team. So, okay, does this make sense? And we get Matt. So we did get Matt and um, it absolutely made sense for them. They played better together. I think, I think even Lucy and Callie played a little better then. And, you know, I think Lucy was just kind of happier in that situation. So um, that's why it made sense. But then it, like you said, it wasn't because of your skill level. Um, and then we next, the next six months were in the challenger and you now are in the challenger draft and you say, okay, well, I mean, with his skill level, he can be a leader. He can be the, the alpha on this team. Um, you know, you're obviously, you know, you're emotional on the court. Um, you're really, really uh, obviously skilled. So we figured, okay, if we get a leader like DJ that can get on the court and kind of bring everyone else's level up with his, you know, with his ability and, and getting people motivated, like, and, and showing that emotion, I think we got a, we got a great start to our team as well. So, um, yeah, we, we thought about it. And then, as you said, like once we were in that challenger, we had Mikey Gendel helping us as well. So he was doing a lot more of the scouting, especially in the challenger. Cause I was, you know, I knew a lot of the top players, but I wasn't going to be someone that really, really knew a lot of the, you know, third and fourth round, um, challenger picks. Yeah. So, um, although I do remember that when the challenger draft was going on and it was later again, like exactly where I was, I was actually commentating because I, I work for ESPN as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm commentating at Wimbledon on center court with Chris Fowler sitting next to me and Mikey's texting me. Alex is texting me like, what should we do about this second round pick? I'm like, guys, I'm in the booth. I really can't <laughs> do this right now. And Chris Fowler, who, I mean, you work with different play, you know, different uh, personalities on air and everything. And he's so good. I mean, he's so researched. He's done all his homework. So you got to be, you know, on your a game to be with him. He'll challenge you on the, uh, you know, in the booth and he'll talk to you about it, you know, everything. So I can't be like looking at my phone and, but like, it's, you know, it's a changeover and I'm going, guys, I really can't, and then um, it goes to the last pick, and we've got another uh, – we go for another male. Um, and then I'm getting these picks, and they're like, what do you think? Should we get Sam Query? And I'm like, guys, I I love Sam Query as a person. It's up to you guys, <laughs> the pickleball stuff. Like, how, how would you want to do it? And then, like, immediately I get a text from Sam. Like, after I saw, okay, the match finishes, I've got, you know, 100 texts from all these guys going back and forth about the draft. And then I get one from Sam, like, really? Didn't want to take me because I didn't. I had no idea either. I didn't know all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't get drafted at all. I was like, oh shoot. Like I feel feel kind of bad. But like hey, I left that up to Mikey and Alex, and they they made the decision, and you know they didn't draft him. But um, it was it, it was it was pretty hectic. But Mikey did a lot of that one with the with the challenger draft. And again, it was just a fu- it was fun to be a part of. And like I said, we're we're previous owners now because we sold the team back to the league, and um, it was just something that um, it made sense for us because Mark. Um, he started a sports fund yeah. and uh, as part of his hedge fund, uh, which is his business, his day to day life, which <laughs> makes him a pretty, pretty, um, pretty nice uh, living. Uh, so he 
didn't have any other personal sports uh, holdings. So it made sense to liquidate all of his uh, all of his personal stuff and now um, take, uh, you know, do everything he can with his sports fund when it comes to the to the sports world. And so he's he's out of it. And I was happy to to be a part of it and finally make him some money because it was it was crazy how it happened that I inv- I asked him to be a part of it. And he did. And he's been so helpful to me in, in general and in a lot of things and a lot of advice and mentorship and stuff. And so for me to actually feel like I can make him some money, I feel pretty uh, feel pretty good about it and makes me feel less guilty about staying at his house every time I go to Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was able, you guys were really, really nice uh, about, you know, coming to all the events. Yeah. I right remember, it. I don't know if it, if it was, me- I think it was Mesa. Mesa. It might have been like your daughter's birthday yeah, or something. Yeah, I came with and, my older daughter. Yeah, and then, you know, we ended up, I mean, I think you came, you flew in, you yeah. drove from the airport to the venue, which is yeah. super far away in the middle yeah. of nowhere. And then you were there, you know, helping us out, clapping. You know, we really, yeah. really, really appreciated that. She still talks about the way that she loves you and uh, and your, uh, well, now fiance, your girlfriend at the time. Mm-hmm. She loved, she was like, they were so nice. And I think it was, uh, yeah, it was your girlfriend that was saying that, like, you know, talking to her about it. She, she is gluten free. My daughter has celiac. And she was talking to her and she was like, oh, she was so nice. And I think she maybe helped her ask the waitress about something. And, uh, so she still talks about why, you know, so you're basically, I mean, now that she watches a lot of pickleball, but you're, you're her favorite. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but also, yeah, it's funny because for everyone to know, like there was no beef between Lucy and I, uh, oh, yeah. I didn't yeah, think no. at least. And, and then again, like once you're playing professional sports, right. Even if it's yeah. just pickleball, cause everyone says just pickleball, like, yeah. It's always just it's business, right? Yeah. Like it's never personal. Like I, ne- yeah. I would never hold it against you or or Mark or Alex or yeah. Mikey. To be like, oh, we traded him. Yeah. It's like it's, it's always business. It's always about thinking what you think is best for you and in the business, right? Yeah. And so th- there was no there was no beef between me and Callie or Lucy or Andre. No. I talked to all of them. It was Lucy's birthday yeah. like a couple days ago. <laughs> yeah. I, I texted her. Yeah. Uh, I talked to Andre often. Kelly's always like super nice. Obviously. Yeah. So there's nothing you can say about Kelly that's wrong. Yeah. Um, but also what people don't don't realize is that every team is different, right? Yeah. So when when people draft, mm. uh, which supposedly there's not as many drafts as there was, so like we're yeah. not gonna have drafting anymore technically, right. but you can now move up and down and whatever. Yeah. Um, is that every team does it differently, right? So when we do the draft, and I've been able to be um, with you guys, I was the fourth pick, but mm-hmm. then later on, I was the first pick. Yeah. As soon as that happens, my phone blows up. Yeah. Right. It's like, hey, dude, I'm available. I've been training a lot. I'm yeah. on course seven times a day, mm-hmm. seven times a day. Yeah. Um, you know, weightlifting, running. Yeah. Um, and honestly, like, some players would, I think some players definitely have a lot of say in who they want in their team. Yeah. And I believe that when we in Challenger when we drafted the team. I had a little bit of say. Yeah. You know, I was mostly talking to Mikey. I was on the phone mm. with Mikey. Yeah. He'd be like, hey, these are the picks, uh, you know, ranked them one through four. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I think blah, blah, blah. But it's mostly, at least with you guys, it was mostly uh, like just giving you information. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't anything like I want this person here right. or I want this person there. And neither yeah. am I really that type of person regardless. Yeah. And yeah, like what people don't understand is that if you – if you own the team or let's mm. say, you know, Mike is the is the GM and mm. he looks at the numbers or you watch the matches, mm. like it's not up to the f- number one pick whether you go or stay. Yeah. Right. Like m- as the number one pick, Mikey could ask me, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah. And it's a little it's a little conflicted because Mikey and I are boys. You and mm. I are boys. Right. Like, yeah. you know, like for somebody like you to be just a text or a call away. Yeah. Like it's it's unbelievable, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's not my decision as a number one pick or number two pick in the team to be like, I want this person out. Yeah. Like and we both know I'm not that way anyway. Yeah. yeah. I've always been like, hey, you know, if you want my thoughts, sure, I guess I can share them with you. But yeah, just do what you think is best. Um but yeah, I mean it's not it's not always up to and I'm saying this more more for the public than anything else. Like we don't have as much of a say as people think yeah. we do because yeah. all of you guys do your job and you guys do the scouting. And that's, that's the case so much more now than it was in the first. Like So in 2022, when we were still the Lions, my first ever pick was, I think we had the third or fourth pick. I picked Jay DeVilliers and still friends with him to this day. He's great. He was just at the Miami Open and really, really nice guy. 
but basically that point I knew so much less about pickleball and we didn't have a GM. We didn't have Mikey Gendel. So he became our GM when mm-hmm. I picked him, when we picked him third or fourth, it was like, Jay, I, I don't know who's who we're taking in the second or third or fourth round. Like I need your help. So now, um, like you said, it's more, we get the first pick and then we can ask for input. Like, Hey, are you, do you feel comfortable playing with this person? Is this all right? But the, the GM has done their homework. So they've, they know, who's been playing well, who's hurt, who's doing this, who's, you know, who's on the downslide, who's going, you know, whose stock is rising. And so they're going to do a lot more of that homework as opposed to that first year back in 2022. Yeah. The players probably had a lot more say those first round picks because there was just less knowledge. There's less, um, yeah, there just wasn't as much information out there. So, um, now you're right. It's, it's the GMs that are doing the work and it, that's why I love you know, any sport that's new and something like this and getting better, like the GMs are getting better too. Everyone's getting better because they're getting more information. They're doing more work as the money gets bigger and bigger. There's going to be more people on the staff. You know, you hope that one day it'll be like those, you know, NFL war rooms where they've got a a whole board and like, who are we going to take? Who are we targeting? What are we doing? And then, um, you know, that becomes uh, the reality of it, that it's so much bigger business. And you're right. You hope there's no hard feelings. There's always going to be um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, oh, like you said, three seconds of like, oh, shoot, I wish it had gone better. But um, you were awesome, by the way, when I did call you, like I had to, I had to call you and I, I don't love making those kind of calls, but it was just, we, you know, we felt like it was the right thing to do. And, um, and for, you know, Alex like, well, your friend's DJ, can you call him? I was like, I don't want to, but <laughs> yes, absolutely. I will. And I, you know, telling you and you were great about it. And, um, you know, and then we had a, a pretty good run in San Clemente with Matt. So it was, uh, it was fun. And I apologize to you for your time with Frisco. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was kind of like throwing me through the wolves <laughs> a little bit. A little bit, a little bit. But um, yeah, it's just, it, it will become more and more big business. I saw there was already a pretty big trade in, um, in the Premier League for, for this season with uh, Jay and, uh, and Tyson kind of swapping. Yeah. So there's going to be more and more of those. And now with the structure, the way they're doing it and adding in the money, um, there's going to be, I think more and more trades. So people will have to get used to, um, switching and it's, it's, it is a little different because it's a little more intimate in pickleball when you're just playing with one other person yeah. and it's just a team of four. It's not a football team where you've got 60 guys on the team or basketball where there's 10 or 12. It, it is just the four of you. So, um, you're right. Every team is different. Some have great chemistry. Some might have, um, disruptive chemistry. Some might work well on the court, but then don't off. And some might be best friends off the court, but then some, for some reason, don't mesh well on the court. Like they just don't play well together or something. So there's going to have to be um, a lot more of those tough decisions from GMs in the future. And now I won't have to be a part of that anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, and it is hard. Right. And, and the way the MLP is going right now, cause it's, it's different than it was like a year or two ago. Right. Mm-hmm. And it seems like, um, you're, if you were a owner still, you, you could somehow make it happen to where, you can get it two players like you could get Lucy and Callie back together. Yeah. Right. You can now you have Ben and Colin playing together. Yeah, I saw that. But even if they weren't, the way that it is built, you can still make it happen, right? Where before yeah. the chances of that happening were like slim to none. Yeah. Right. Where now you can say, okay, we can trade my number two for your number four and twenty five thousand dollars what yeah. do you think <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know? it gives way more leeway because you're right the trades back then were so rare um and the, even the trade we made with with matt i think only happened because of matt and lucy's relationship so that was why it <clears throat> made sense otherwise you know there were so few of those trades because it's just i mean it, it could only generally be one player for one player you know sometimes teams could try to get creative with okay one man and one woman and maybe the the man is much more skilled than the other man, but then the woman is much more skilled and you know, you could trade it that way, but they were just so rare. And now I think you're going to see a lot more of it because there'll be, there's also, there's a lot of GMs that are doing their job, but there's also some owners that have now they're, they've put in real money into these teams and the finances of it involved. Um, they're looking to figure out a way to make a profit. And so if it is trade this player for this player, but you get 50,000 to then spend on the team the next year. Okay. Well, then that becomes worth it. And so there'll be a lot more kind of maneuvering. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, how the teams end up being right. Because Mm -hmm. like I said, you could technically have two males and two females that played already together, Mm -hmm. or you could have two males and two females that don't really play with each other, but 
because they're kind of stuck maybe, then you could see them playing at PPAs as well now. Yeah. Um, it'll also be interesting to see how what percentage of the teams are like, we're going to tough it out, and I want all of you guys to, you know, get better together, mm -hmm. uh, form and create that sort of uh, chemistry. Because I also, you know, maybe maybe you feel differently about it, but chemistry is also something you can be built. Right? Yeah. Like the more you practice together, the yeah. more time you spend with someone. Definitely. If you enjoy them as a person off the court as well, like it can be built, yeah. right? So I wonder what percentage of teams is going to be, um, you know, kind of like, okay, we had a bad run mm -hmm. once or twice. Let's tr let's keep trying. And yeah. what percentage is going to be like, okay, well, we'll just trade you. Yeah. And not a big deal. Like you didn't work out for us. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting as well if they if they really start going to the the geographic model where, okay, if you're playing for the um, the New York Hustlers, you should be based around New York and should we start getting uh, players that are based there that are able to practice together in that city uh, really often. And um, if they do that, you're right. Chemistry can be built and you'll find that out, I think, a lot more throughout an entire season or the fact that they're going to stay together for multiple seasons. Okay. This just isn't working. They're just not enjoying their company and that's bleeding over onto the court. So now what needs to happen? Is there a trade that needs to happen or is there some way to uh, sort of repair that, um, that kind of chemistry? So it will definitely be fun to see. And will that then bleed into, okay, you know, they were a team that did well together in PPA and now they're playing an MLP. And I mean, L Lucy and Cali played great at PPA and then for some reason didn't do well at MLP. Uh, so is that going to then, if that happens over time and time and time again, are they going to start questioning, should we not play PPA together? Should we start looking other directions? Um, so it'll be, I think it's going to, they're, they're all going to kind of be um, very fluid and that's going to be fun to see. Um, and I think for GMs, um, it's going to make their job more difficult and more valuable. Yeah. And that's where then again, the big money could come in. Right. Yep. And, and you want to spend the money on someone like you did in tennis mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, that's really going to. Um, you know, have a bigger benefit than anything else on your team. Yeah. Right. So I know, I know Adam Stone spends a lot of time on, mm -hmm. on the research. He also has a lot of input and insight because, you know, he was a really good player at one point. Yeah. Right. Um, there's also, I got drafted to the Black Bears this time in Challenger, yeah. which I'm super excited about. Yeah. Uh, I love Jimmy Miller. I think it's yeah. hilarious. And I'd yeah. love to have him on the pod one day. <laughs> um, but, you know, then again, they had this, Black Bear Combine at the Pickler, okay. um, you know, a, a couple of months ago, uh, you know, and they had a bunch of guys and girls. I know they brought up Alex Strong, Tyra Black. They brought up uh, Amanda Henry. I mean, there were so many players, right? And and that's the Black Bears putting in time and effort yeah. and honestly money at that point yeah. to, to see, okay, who do we want in our team the next season, right? Yeah. So for me to be drafted in a team where they use care so deeply about it, mm -hmm. it's awesome. And even just yesterday, I mean, we have a you know big group chat with everybody. Mm -hmm. And even just yesterday, they, they already sent us a text that Richie, the owner, mm -hmm. uh, was going to be basically helping out more than he's supposed to with all the accommodations and yeah. all that stuff, which can get really expensive, yeah. right? So all of that goes a long way. And even if you're not a black bear already, it mm. makes you want to play at some point for that team. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is awesome. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk to you about, yeah. uh, and then I'm going to thank my sponsors and <laughs> then I'm going to kind of, you know, open it up to whatever you want to talk about for a little bit. Okay. It's, uh, I don't, I don't watch many podcasts. I don't keep, I don't keep my eye on things as, as often as I used to, especially because now I have, a child, yeah, <laughs> you know, so now take like, a lot of your time. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm like playing pickleball, working out, mm -hmm. child, right? Yeah. Um, but what's this, uh, Christian Alshon, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, James man, Blake, Andy Roddick, funny. little beef? Tell, yeah. Tell me a little so, bit about it. Yeah. Well, it take. I'm not generally a guy that's going to get on social media and talk a lot of trash. That's just not my style. You know me for a while, and I know that's and anyone that's followed me or seen me knows that I'm not generally <laughs> a a big trash talker or anything like that. But um, I just took exception a little bit to something Christian said, and I don't know, I've never met him. So it's not something that's, oh, this has been brewing for a long time, but the way sometimes he talks, whether it's on social media or wherever is, um, 
as we talked about it before, like when you're a good junior, it doesn't mean you got to the top level of your sport. And it's, it is a huge gap. And he talks about like, oh, well, this one, he said, pickleball takes more, has taught me more about athleticism and has taken more athleticism, made me a better athlete than tennis ever did. And I just took exception to that a little bit because he's talking about the level of tennis that he was playing, which was a good junior, um, not a good division one player and a pretty good division two or division three tennis player, which, you know, for a lot of people, that's great. But to take that and compare it to top level pickleball, because he is one of the best pickleball players in the world. So you're comparing it to top level pickleball when you played a level of tennis that and the way he makes it seem is that they're equivalent. And it's not because he never saw the top level of tennis. It's not it, comparable. It's not. And that's that was kind of my point. I'm sure I made it um, in not the exact appropriate way because <laughs> I, I often, I, when I do talk on Twitter, I wish I had more than 140 characters or however many characters it is because <laughs> I want to explain myself. But I just said, like, you're talking, you're dealing with a different level of tennis than you are in pickleball. And if you were to see what it takes, the ex- the expertise, the, the training, the, the physicality that it takes to be top 10 in the world in tennis, you're not say, you, you wouldn't be saying these same things, I don't think. And so I, I don't like the fact that you're comparing it, you know, you're comparing tennis and pickleball, but that's like comparing, I don't know, um, you know, high school baseball to NFL football. You know, it's not, you know, because you played high school baseball doesn't mean you know what it takes to be Mike Trout. And so I just took exception to him comparing the two when, um, it w- it's not the same level of tennis and pickleball. So I started by saying, and then it, I think it took off because I said, I, I did say it was a low level of tennis. And a lot of people took exception to that because, you know, that's you know, a lot of pe- for a lot of people, that's kind of their ceiling where they get to, whether it's, um, you know, a 4-0 level tennis player or a division three, division two player or anything like that. Or he was a good junior. Um, and so calling it a low level, people took exception to that, but then, um, they started it as it's just this tennis versus pickleball. And then Andy jumped in and said, (laughs) and said that it was the dumbest take on Twitter for the day, which is tough to do or something like that. And, and Nick just being Nick said, no, I'll just go hide under a table. You had too many tequilas to be text to be tweeting that. And then it just went back and forth and he said, he started challenging us to pickleball matches and, um, all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, so it just, it just took on a life of its own. Cause like, I don't, I don't normally use social media that much. And so for that time, it was pretty funny for me for about two days to every time I turned on my phone or every time I looked at it, there was, you know, 20 new tweets back at me mm-hmm. or, and I mean, most of them were, it, it's almost like they wanted to play into. It. And I'm sure part of it was for attention for, for him, but like part of it was, you know, wanting to make this tennis versus pickleball war. And I should not be, I'm the last person that wants to get into a tennis versus pickleball war. Cause I love them both. I yeah. love tennis. I love pickleball. I love playing both. I love supporting both. So I don't want to like take anyone down that's doing it. I just took exception to comparing that level of tennis to the top level of pickleball. Cause I don't think it's, I don't think you can, you can speak from a level of experience when you don't have the experience mm-hmm. uh, to talk about there. Yeah, and I mean, it's just funny to me, right? Because, like, then again, growing up watching, uh, especially Andy Roddick, right? Yeah. Like, everyone, everyone at some point tried to serve, like, Andy, right? <laughs> yeah. And then later on in, in life, uh, watching Nick Kyrgios play, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they will have huge, huge personalities, yeah. right? And I think they're both hilarious. Like, yeah. I probably spent, like, hours and hours back in the day watching, like, funniest moments, Andy Roddick <laughs> and interviews, right? And things yeah. like that. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, nowadays in the world, like it's become so much about eyeballs, yeah. more than more than just uh, speaking truth or, yeah. or or doing the right thing or whatever, right? That like, and I'm not saying that's what Christian is doing, you know. Yeah. Even though he's a Twitter king, um, <laughs> I don't know what his what his true intentions were. I like Christian. I think we get along decently well. Um, but then again, it kind of falls back into maybe this sense of like. I'll do whatever for the views. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you could always see that uh, years ago when YouTube got started and you had all these people doing these like like insane things you, just to get those That's views to yeah. become somebody. Yeah. Right. And and in my opinion, it's just not the right way to do so. Yeah. Uh, but some people, and then again, I'm not I'm not saying Christian is doing it. Maybe he yeah. truly feels that way. Yeah. Uh, and and if he does, and you know, good for him. <laughs> yeah. I. Then again, I didn't play that level of tennis, so I wouldn't, I can't compare it. Yeah. And honestly, like if I'm being totally honest, even though I'm better than you at pickleball, I know that if we were, if we were both the same age and we were both uh, spending the same amount of time on the court and or training, 
you kick my ass, <laughs> right? Well, you never know. I mean, that's all. It's all an unknown. I mean, I, I, I'd like to. I'd maybe like to think so yeah. for my ego, but um, you don't know. And that's where that, the same thing to be said is like that. I would take. Um, I would take exception to that because I don't know. I'd like to think that oh, I'd get better, but I might hit a ceiling in pickleball. Mm-hmm. And you've seen me. I've gotten a lot better. But that might be it. I might not get any better. And that's what I think probably Christian ran into is because he was a really good junior. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it, from what I've heard about his college career, he hit a ceiling and he just wasn't getting any better at that point. And whether that's because he didn't love the game, because he didn't have the abilities, because he didn't have the power, because he didn't have the speed, because he didn't have whatever, he didn't have the mentality, whatever it was. I'm not I'm not saying speculating any one thing, but he wasn't able to get to that, that next level. And now he's taking it to pickleball, and he's uh, it's great that he loves it, that he puts in hard work, and that he's as good as he is. Um, and maybe that's the difference is that he really loves it, and maybe he didn't love tennis. I don't know. But he doesn't know what it takes to go from that level to the top. I don't know what it takes in pickleball. So for me to say, oh, I absolutely, if I had trained when I was 25, I'd be number one in the world – I don't know that. I, I, I can I do. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can hope, but I don't I don't say for sure. And that's just why I took exception a little bit to Christian saying that because he doesn't know uh, what it's like to get there. Yeah, and I can totally agree with that. You know, where, where I'm coming from, though, it's from a point, you know, and it's, it's different than yours. Right. Because yeah. I do believe tennis is harder than pickleball. Yeah, uh, that's why. Uh, a lot of us just didn't make it in tennis or in a certain sport that's like considered harder. Right. Yeah. And you see some pretty good tennis level player that comes to pickleball three mm. months in and it's like a total stud, right? That doesn't happen yeah. in tennis. So it's, right. just, it's just really easy to like go about it. Um, but even for me, like you're faster than I am. You're, you jump higher, right? <laughs> and yeah. all these things. And, and that's, a, you, you, you're like 20 years older than me, <laughs> right? So, so yeah. for me to look at that as a 24 year old, you're like 44, right? Yeah. Um, and you're still faster than me. Your hands are <laughs> insanely quick. <laughs> Uh, you jump higher. Like, first of all, it's motivating, right? Yeah. And secondly, like, you are overall a better athlete. Like, it is what it is. What it is. <laughs> like, I mean, appreciate like, that. I like yeah. to think so, but I don't know. I, yeah. It's, just, it's. I mean, yeah, I, I did a lot of work to get there, though. So I, 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 like I told you when we when we practiced, like, I used to do these footwork drills. I would do them six days a week. So this is why I'm still fast. It's because I did a ton of work, and you've got time to do that work. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I... I I like to think at 24, at 24, look, put it this way, at 24, I wasn't the best (coughs) athlete um, I ever was. I was still getting better. So at 24, I uh, I appreciate you saying that I'm a better athlete, but you've got, you still have time to get better. I mean, you're not, you haven't, I hope you haven't hit your peak yet. So you're just getting better and better. So if we have the same discussion in three years and you've become the best pickleball player of all time and you're, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're faster, you're stronger, you've done all these things like, well, now we see where you've gotten to it. Uh, you know, you've gotten to your potential and you've really reached that and you put in that hard work. So let's not, you know, let's not say it quite yet. I, I, I hope you're, um, you know, I hope you're, you're still getting to, to your peak. Yeah, and one thing that I do know, if if that was the case, you would have never traded me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a short lift, short short time. It was just for that one match. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm just gonna say, uh, you know, thanks to my sponsors, Engage oh. Stack. I'm wearing them; th- they're tank top right now. Might make it a thing because I pay. I play in tank tops only. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Head, uh, for you know providing me with the best shoes. Uh, here is my phone case that uh, the company made for me, and. Yeah, if you guys, anybody wants to, you know, sponsor the podcast, let me know. And, you know, this is your time to add and say whatever you want to say. Honestly, I think we could both sit here for 10 hours yeah. and just talk nonstop. But, yeah, yeah, it's all up to you now. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I, I, I like I just said, I don't ever want to make it tennis and pickleball as, uh, you know, contrary. I love both of them. I love you having me on, having a tennis player on that has gotten into the world of pickleball. So, um, I love watching you play. I love watching a lot of players uh, in pickleball, and I, I want to see it continue to rise and rise. And I'm not one of these tennis players that wants to say like, "Oh, we need to, you know, squash out pickleball because you know just focus on tennis." There's there's room in the sports world for both to succeed, and um, tennis isn't going anywhere. The Wimbledon's not going anywhere. U.S. Open isn't going anywhere, and pickleball's not going anywhere. So let's um, hopefully find a way to. To sort of marry the two. I love it. I've uh, we've talked about kids and I have my kids. It's great when I take them to up to the club and play tennis for half an hour and pickleball for half an hour. And, you know, it just keeps them entertained and keeps them occupied and doing something with a racket or a paddle in their hand. I love it. And I think one just kind of, you know, works into the other. So I, um, I'm happy to be here and I love, um, 
I always love supporting pickleball and you too. And it's, uh, it's been fun getting to know you these last few years and, and uh, hopefully seeing more and more success. And I appreciate that, bro. And yeah, I can totally attest to the fact that you're, you're super nice. Uh, <laughs> nice. Now you have two daughters, so you yeah. you become probably uh, softer. more mellow, softer, yeah. <laughs> right? So really easy to talk to, super nice, mellow, yeah. la- laid back, yeah. in my opinion, at <laughs> least, right? Like you can, you can yeah. talk to anybody. And I know, and I can say, you know, I've known you for a couple of years now, and we yeah. get along really well. Like, you both, you love both sports, and you want both sports to keep growing, Absolutely. right? So it's, it's never been, at least for you, it's never been tennis versus pickleball, but it's been yeah. more of a... Uh, tennis with pickleball or Absolutely. you know or tennis and pickleball right yeah. but then again thanks for having uh thanks for coming over i love Pleasure. having you bro and yeah thanks for everything Back to you, Jeff.